Hi, everybody. We want to welcome you to um, the webinar today. This is our the second part in a series of webinar, a two part series of webinars to share the findings and recommendations from um, CSSP's work through the Pediatric Supporting Parents Initiative. Um, so this second part of the webinar of the webinar series is going to focus on the rec the recommendations that uh, CSSP put forth around transforming systems um, and to, in, to support pediatric transformation to promote the social and emotional development of young children. Next slide, Selena. We want to get, first get started by um, thanking the, the funding collaborative, the Pediatric Supporting Parents Funder Collaborative, for supporting this work and making it possible for us to, to um, learn so much from the field. Uh, it's a group of six funders that have com come together over the last uh, three years to support this work. Um, we're very grateful for the opportunity. So I wanted to share the objectives for today's call. We are going to briefly share the 14 common practices and examples of how they've been implemented. This was the focus of our last uh, webinar, so we won't go into detail, but want to make sure that folks have just a brief um, understanding so we're sort of all at the same page. We're then going to talk a bit about what we learned from our project about the barriers that are likely holding back or limiting the large-scale adoption and implementation of those common practices that we found. And then lastly, we're going to dive in to provide some recommendations for action to address those barriers. Next slide. Um, we are going to, here's a look at what, how we'll be spending our time today. Um, we, uh, I am joined by my colleague, Selena Chavez at, uh, at CSSP, as well as Dr. Kima Taylor and Johanna Ramirez. Um, who both Kima and Joanna were part of the PSP project and provided us with perspectives from both providers and parent leaders. So as we did last time, we are going to invite both of those perspectives as I think one of the big learnings from this project was how important it was to have both the parent and provider perspective as we're thinking about uh, and, and planning for system practice and systems level changes. And so we think it'll be important for you all to hear their perspectives along the way. Uh, we will, as I said before, dive into some, just give a brief overview of the common practice, but spend most of our time sharing uh, about those barriers and discussing with um, our parent and provider panel. Next slide. Uh, we would love to get your questions along the way uh, to help bring that to our panel as well as just make sure that we're being as clear as possible or can, and can get you the information from this report. Um, we have notice on the, on the slide here, please provide, put your questions into the Q&A part of Zoom. This allows us to keep track of them all and as well as get those answers out to the entire group later. Next slide. So we want to get started to, by um, getting a feel for who all of you are. So we're going to do a quick poll uh, for you to let us know uh, where uh, the, the perspective that you're bringing to this work. So please we'll leave this open for a few minutes to kind of for a minute to hear who you who you are um, today. So it looks like we have folks from every perspective, some policymakers, program implementers, a few providers. That other category is still big. If you are able to, please chat into the put in the chat um, who you when you're when if you picked other who you are, what you represent. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Just to be able to show, um, you guys can see that we still have that big other category, but we've got some policymakers and then a um, and program developers and implementers. Welcome to all of you. And some um, folks coming from the AAP, welcome. So I'm going to pass it over to Selena, who's going to share a brief background of the project itself, sort of what we did to come to these recommendations. 
Hi everyone, my name is Selena. I'm a program research assistant um, at CSSP and I was working on the PSP program analysis project basically from its inception to finishing up and writing the report. So we're really excited to finally share our results, um, to have our report up and running, and I want to do a little bit of an overview of exactly how we got to where we are. Um, so the purpose of the program analysis is um, what we have here to study what is currently being done and what may be possible in the pediatric well child visit ages zero to three in the pediatric primary care setting to promote social and emotional development in the parent child relationship. And so what we we're really interested in doing was looking at different programs as a way of learning what was being done in pediatric and and um, pediatric settings to kind of figure out what are those common elements, why are they succeeding, what is making, why are they, you know, what are the barriers that they're coming up and challenging um, to kind of paint a vision of what pediatrics could look like. Um, so this is a little bit about our process. We started with reviewing 70 um, programs and this was actually kind of like our first shortlist, we actually reviewed um, hundreds of programs through registries, but after going through and looking at relevant programs um, to our uh, interest in social emotional development, um, we did that through registries, literature, and also did a nomination form that we sent out to our partners um, to be able to kind of get a full list of programs that would be relevant for us to look at. Um, and we we were able to look at a lot, but of course we recognized that there were some that may have gone missed. So while we were really happy to get a really good variety of programs, of course there's some, it wasn't fully um, representative of every single program that they have out there. Um, so after going through all these programs, we um, created a short list of 13 programs and uh, we did site visit, 13 site visits with a team which included a family leader and a pediatrician. Um, so for example, we had um, an advisory group of parent leaders, our parent leader brain trust, which Johanna was part of, um, but that also included other family members who uh, were from around the country and had different perspectives. And then we had a group of pediatricians, which Akima was part of, and that also included other, uh, other pediatricians representing different parts of the country and different perspectives as well. Um, and we wanted to have one family leader and one pediatrician on each visit. Um, and sometimes the family leaders were part of our brain trust, but sometimes we also reached out to local affiliates to be able to um, find local family members to get involved with our site visits. And then we facilitated, facilitated a stakeholder meeting at the end of all these site visits and when we were still gathering evidence and gathering analysis um, with developers, implementers, pediatricians, and family leaders. So all the people that we had met on our travels, um, we were able to come together and bring us all in one room to help really inform our final report. So this pic first picture up there, that is one picture um, with all the family leaders that were able to come to our convening um, and our family voices partners. And then the bottom one is a uh, panel of the pediatricians that we had. And then of course it finally culminated with our, our final report. Um, so this is a list of all the programs that we visited. Um, we try to get a good variety of location, um, of types of programs, of settings. In some, we were actually able to do two to kind of, you know, get a different sense of programs in uh, different settings. Um, for example, Healthy Steps, we went to a rural mountain town in Sholo, Arizona, but we also went to the Bronx, New York. So it was really interesting to see how that program was implemented in two very different places. Um, and we visited uh, these ones uh, at the top, these 10 programs, um, but there were due to a few logistical problems, there was a couple of programs that we weren't able to visit in person, but we still had um, very extensive conversations with the ones here um, at the bottom. Um, but as we mentioned, these were really great, great programs to visit, but of course there were so many more that we wished that we could have and, and even through our review learned so much um, by even looking at and learning about other programs. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to Stephanie to kind of talk a little bit of an overview of what we learned during those visits. Thank you, Selena. So go to the next slide. Here we go. So what we were able, to, uh, what we were, one of our first charges as part of this project was to be able to understand the common 
practices, both what was happening in, with between the care team and the family to promote social emotional development and the parent child relationship, but also try to understand what are those processes, policies, protocols, partnerships that really support effective implementation. And we came across um, three, 14 common practices that sort of very nicely fell into three buckets. Um, those buckets were um, in what we call action areas. So one was really around nurturing parents' confidence and confidence. And this really focused on what is happening with the family, what's happening in that, between that relationship and the care visit, in the visit, as well as some of the other supports provided to them. Uh, the second action areas was connecting families to additional supports to promote healthy social emotional development and address stressors. We noticed across the board that families, that clinics were identifying needs and, and universal supports for families, thing, the library times, moms, group, parents groups, um, uh, uh, lactation groups that all families needed connections to, as well as when there was a, a need for that family, getting them connected to concrete supports, jobs, housing, food, food, uh, food security resources so that they can meet those basic needs. Um, and then lastly, we saw a whole host of practices that really focused on building a care team and clinic infrastructure and culture that really allowed this implementation and, and innovation to succeed. And these were intentional structures that really supported that team to collaborate, communicate, and innovate together. Next slide. So here and really in our, um, our, our report, you can find uh, the 14 practices called out by these different action areas. And with each one, we provide examples of what we saw um, on, on the ground when we were out, out visiting these programs. Um, so things like, and there was also, you know, we never just saw, saw just once. I really want to highlight that these were really truly common. They might have looked a little bit different from place to place. But at the end of the day, you could see uh, across the board how uh, providers were um, building relationships with families using toys or books to join with that family, reflect together, provide that positive strength-based feedback to the family to strengthen their competence and confidence, as well as provide, help them to reflect about their child's behavior. We often saw a connection and partner, deep partnerships with community, and we saw very intentional structures for communication and collaboration. And lastly, one thing we definitely noticed was that across the board, the care team was not limited to one uh, provider. It was truly a team that involved community health workers, physicians, nurse practitioners, the front desk, um, community partners, all coming together to support families. Next slide. And with that, the common thread throughout those common practices was a uh, strong, humble, strength-based relationship um, with the family, amongst the team, and with the community. And we want to share this quote that, that actually comes uh, from Johanna that, about how um, it really, how critical um, it was a reflection to really think about how equity was a key part in thinking about these relationships, that we really need to address our own biases to be able to think about building that relationship. One of the other pediatrician consultants also raised for everyone to think about how who, who do you, reflecting on who do you think has strength and being able to really think about those biases in order to formulate and build a really strength-based uh, relationship. Next slide. However, what, and what was also incredibly powerful that we were able to learn from being out there in the field um, was what these folks were clearly innovators. They were working um, to really uh, put for, to really meet the needs in families and build systems around families to support family social and emotional development and help children thrive. Um, but we were able to really recognize and start to learn about what are those constraints and barriers that are really sort of limiting the adoption of these common practices um, more widely so that they're more accessible to families across the country. And we found two um, categories of constraints. First were systemic constraints. And so these were really things that were, um, that we recognize as being a constraints across that influence medical practice more broadly. Um, things like time and financing, data for improvement, and physician training. 
However, even if these systemic issues had been addressed, we also found a category of barriers that would still limit uh, widespread adoption. And these we, we categorized as um, readiness, preparation and readiness. Um, um, barriers. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these. Next slide. So as I'm sure there's no surprise to anybody on this on this webinar that time and money was a clear uh, constraint for folks. And what this often looked like was that what we often saw when we were out in the field is that it was very rarely uh, we found that folks were financing their um, programs and all of the resources for families um, through grant dollars, philanthropy, or a research grant. Um, and so it was something where at times they were having these hard conversations of like, what would we cut if we needed to, um, rather than thinking about how might we grow and build. Um, and it really limited their ability um, and was a constant source of stress. And we know that this is something that really folks think about, how can I finance this? How can we sustain this if we get it started? That might be a limited factor for, for people to take on these types of practices. The next uh, constraint was around in this area was around data for learning and improvement. We rarely saw folks using data um, regularly to inform their practice and population health and recognize that there isn't agreement on a universal uh, set of measures to help guide this work for clinical practice, population health, and quality improvement. And lastly, in this area, we really explored what came up a lot, but I have to admit was something that we wanted to talk about, but needs far more learning to, to really understand what's going, what, what are the needs and opportunities here, was around physician training. We often heard uh, from the physicians that we were meeting with across the country that I wasn't trained this way, that the... Uh, approaches to sort of strength-based observation and feedback was something that's really hard. I think other providers in other fields also recognize it's a different way of thinking that takes training, coaching, and um, support. Um, and this is something that folks recognize would, would really require a shift um, to support that type of training. Next slide. We then uh, moved on to sort of if these systemic areas are addressed, uh, we, we would have um, some pe readiness and capacity issues that might limit adoption um, with pediatric care teams. And one of the big pieces that we saw, as I mentioned earlier, is we saw that there was always an expanded care team um, where they had multiple roles joining in to provide care for that family. And what we recognized while we were out there that would make this a barrier is this is a whole new, uh, on one hand, this is a whole new workforce. We often heard that uh, folks were hiring for the right people and that right person was not only someone who had the technical skills or the, relate or the community relationships and background, but also were humble, warm, um, and empathetic. And so these are uh, attributes where we really need to think about developing a, a workforce and then having the internal skill uh, structures and supports to help that person be able to, to be part of that. In addition, in working with diverse groups, we also saw that there were limitations around the workforce, having folks be able to deliver services in the language um, of, of the family was a huge constraint. Um, however, the other aspect of this was the, you know, as if you're building out your care team, creating this, having the time and, and going back to the financing to create the structures to really support that team to work well together, to have the training um, in, in these new practices and to have the time to coordinate and collaborate together. We then moved on and learned a lot about training and technical assistance capacity. What we learned is most folks at the local level were receiving training in TA from national centers that might be affiliated with their program. However, they are often, one, trying to bring together multiple programs to really meet the needs of families and, and needed to be thinking about really how do I bring all of these and align these programs together to work well for families. And secondly, uh, there might be other um, other needs, uh, training and TA needs that they need to sort of bring into the into it. So it ended up, it, while it might not be widely accessible for folks because it's connected to national centers, there's also this need that to go beyond and think more holistically about the implementation TA needed. We um, 
often at every site tried to talk with families and get an understanding with how folks were engaging families in the implementation of their programs and practices. And we saw very little of this. Often we would, we would hear about how they might be engaged at a national level or in the early research, but in the day-to-day -day sort of implementation and quality improvement of a program, um, it was limited. And sometimes folks were able to connect to their the board of their FQHC that includes patients or um, a quality improvement project, but it was definitely a challenge for folks to regularly get feedback from families and to engage them in, in um, quality improvement and implementation. And lastly, again, I don't think this will be a surprise to folks on phone. We often, we did hear hesitancy around screening, like I, I want to screen for food insecurity, but what am I going to do if I get a positive screen? And then where folks had overcome some of those hesitancies, we also learned about there was only so much they could do within the four walls to be able to develop those deep partnerships, curate regular uh, list of resources, and there might be gaps in resources in their community that they had a hard time seeing the big picture because they are one practice. And so being connected to a system that can um, understand the gaps, see, see, know where quality services are, ensure quality, culturally relevant services for families was a huge need um, and one that made their job more difficult as it had to, this type of work needed to happen clinic by clinic by clinic rather than in a systemic approach. Next slide. Based off of those constraints and barriers, we really tried to think about what our recommendations would be. And again, trying to keep it simple, <laughs> we came up with three big recommendations that obviously we broke down into some multiple parts. Next slide, Selena. So our first one that we felt was really important to get started was with building a national leadership, leadership for systems change, making uh, race equity explicit. And we, this part we had, we, we really went back and forth and some folks might say, oh, you need to put this at, this happens at the end or this happens at the beginning. But I want to thank uh, Kima for keeping this at the foreground for us that it has to happen at the same time that we need to be consistently building leadership of and two key leaders and stakeholders here are parents and physicians. And, um, providers to be part of this movement, to be actively thinking about an advocacy and communications agenda to really move this, to advocate and um, make uh, very visible the need for this type of transformation. And it can't, it has to be from the very beginning to keep this movement going. And in doing that, and starting with having parents at the center, race equity really needs to be explicit. Um, what, while we think that while this sort of efforts for zero to three-year-olds is important for all families, we think that this is an incredible opportunity to really focus on the needs of families of color and families with low income that are more impacted by um, lack of access to some of these quality services um, or access to healthcare in the same way. And so it's really important for us to take a targeted universalism approach to this work and really focus in on those places of most need. But then secondly, we really need to make sure any data that we're looking at is really broken down by race and culture so we can understand what works and for whom um, and be able to make do that work well. And then finally, we can't um, stay sort of in, we have to be thinking about not only the practice change, but also raising that data up, raising those experiences up and understanding patterns um, and opportunities where we can advocate to address the root causes. So we can advocate for better service, better um, access to um, to uh, supports for and child care for families or better access to different types of um, culturally relevant services for a particular population and really take a systemic policy approach to this work. Next slide. Our next bucket of, of, um, of recommendations really focus on those systemic barriers. Uh, we one, clearly, one of them has to be around creating a reliable and sustainable financial support. And Selena, can you go to the next slide real quick? And this was something that the PSP funder collaborative also recognized was something that we would need to get started. We didn't need to wait for a report to know that. And so some early action has been taken in this area that we think could be a great place to build from. Um, and so we want to just point folks to the a report that really looked at the opportunities within Medicaid 
to leverage Medicaid to support the, this transformation. And right now, a work group of seven states are beginning to tack, uh, test out different ways that Medicaid can really support and uh, catalyze this type of transformation in pediatric care. We know that it can't be limited to Medicaid and that we need to be thinking about other funding sources and other sustainable financing opportunities uh, to do this work. Next slide. Um, we also feel, really need to get back to this data piece and that we need to be thinking about data that that our, uh, the sites can collect that are um, really relevant to clinical practice so that this is uh, data that can inform what they're doing uh, with families. It can then also be used to raise up um, for population and quality improvement and help us also make the case. Um, and so there's real need, but we need to be doing this with the understanding that this, so these are busy pediatric primary care clinics that they are also then connected to early child, hopefully to early childhood systems. And so how do we think about the infrastructure and the design of those tools so that they are minimally burdensome and really, really relevant and useful and actionable for clinics? Um, and then lastly, we put forth that there's a real opportunity to do more learning and thinking around enhancing medical education to really support uh, um, the physicians of the future to uh, learn about uh, to learn about this different way, this relational um, health way of practicing. And we had a chance to visit some residency programs through where programs had been um, integrated into residency programs through Reach Out and Read or promoting first relationships. And one thing we noticed is that often that happened in the outpatient rotation. But one thing we want to put forth is this type of relational practice is important across the board with working with families. And that family in the ICU, that is such a prime time where that parent really needs that strengths-based supportive feedback um, as they're trying to really care for their child in that incredibly stressful and, and scary situation. Next slide. Um, and then as, as we're sort of opening up those systemic barriers and making it, you know, uh, opening it up the feasibility that folks might be able to take this on, um, we talk a little bit about how we might support p pediatric primary care team and community readiness. Um, so in that first area, we talk about the care team preparation and exp uh, expansion. And this is really where we put forth that these t teams, it has to be a team approach, and we need to be thinking uh, creatively and innovatively about who is on that team. And we saw all different kinds of roles joining that team, from legal partners who are able to provide consultations and address social determinants of health needs, uh, as well as family partners who part of their job description was lived experience as a parent who can support that family um, as peers as well as help them navigate uh, different systems and services. Um, and in doing so, uh, teams will need support to build their preparation and readiness to be able to welcome and work together in different ways. Um, Connected to that is really thinking about our systems for supporting training and technical assistant capacity and really, really thought about this in two ways. One was how might we think about um, the common practices and think more holistically about uh, training and technical assistance, really helping uh, from the outset clinics and communities put the pieces together so they're not left to have to figure that out on their own. Um, there's so much wisdom in these evidence, these practices, and the local communities that are implementing them. And we think that there's a real opportunity to build and join with those programs to think about um, a sustainable home for training and technical assistance for this transformation. We also had the privilege to really think, learn about how um, clinics could be and communities could be joined in, net, in improvement networks um, to support and accelerate this transformation. We visited Q-TIP in South Carolina where 30 practices have been joined in on a improvement and um, an improvement network for the last eight years that has been sustained by the state of South Carolina. And not only did that allow for um, those clinics to take up different workflows and structures and resources and screenings in a faster, uh, more accelerated way, but it also created a shared purpose across clinics across 
uh, South Carolina, where they are not only working to improve the lives of the children in their clinic, but also they're part of a bigger movement in South Carolina. And we heard directly from staff and physicians on how that really um, uh, brought joy back into their work. Um, we also, a big one was investing in and incentivizing partnerships with family-led organizations and systems change. This is another great area of capacity building where there is a local infrastructure already there. So really thinking about as we engage and practice in, in systems change, how do we um, partner with uh, uh, family-led organizations in our community to support that? Those family-led organizations are able to bring, you know, more than one family leader to be more than a checkbox um, as part of these initiatives and to provide the mentoring and support to do that. At the same time, they have links to families across their communities that can help sort of build demand for this type of transformation and help families think like, oh, I want to go to a clinic that has these types of resources and really kind of spur um, advocacy from that, that perspective. And then lastly, all of this work, we really truly believe that clinics and pediatrics need to be embedded within a community system um, that is designed to promote children's social and emotional development and respond to family needs. So that it's not each individual clinic's responsibility to form partnerships and, and curate resources and be thinking about systems and policies change, but they are part of a community system that is able to do that across the board, really being able to use data um, and use uh, both data quantitatively and qualitatively to promote the quality of resources, ensure that people have accessible ex access to culturally relevant, uh, culturally responsive services, and that we're able to identify um, patterns and use data to advocate for policy and systems change. Next slide. So this is a lot, and when we as a team were really thinking about presenting this webinar, we knew that for certain that this was going to be a lot. So we wanted to take a chance, take some time with our panel to really start to get their reflections um, and, and maybe make it a little less overwhelming um, to all of you about what we're trying to accomplish here. So I'm going to welcome Kima and Johanna to start to help us reflect a little bit about what we're putting forward here. Um, so the first question we wanted to dive into is, uh, we, before going on the site visits, what did you think might be the biggest barrier to implementation? And, and how did you see the sites navigate around that barrier? So I'd like to, to get started there. I can. Um, sure. Hi, this is Kima. I want to thank everyone for joining the call. And um, the, great thanks to CSSP for allowing me to be part of this great project. You know, I think um, when I first uh, heard about the project and going on the site visits, I thought for sure the biggest barrier would be time. You know, whether it's fee for service or even managed care, providers have to see a certain amount of patients to stay afloat. Even if it's, you know, managed care payment, if the payment isn't robust, you have to see a certain amount of patients and a certain amount of time to stay afloat. And so for the work they were talking about, really engaging and adding the social emotional um, component said to me, you need time not only to do the screening and to talk about books, et cetera, but really to engage and learn and build relationship with family. To have that humble relationship takes time. And so I really thought the largest barrier would be time and somewhat burnt out physicians because they did have to see a certain amount of um, clients every day. I think though, the fascinating thing is that the programs had different ways of getting around this. Some of them actually didn't have the provider doing everything. And this I think is the kind of <laughs> ideal way. And so sometimes other folks in the team would ask the questions, synthesize the answers, and be able to have some of that conversation with the patients and families, as well as then giving the information to the pediatrician. And some of them, they did it differently. They truly restructured the pediatrician's times. So for instance, in centering, they really had a much longer time to be able to be with the patients while still having that team gathering and working with and being in relationship with the families. Um, but I also think that they, the, not just that they had time then for other people to help and build a whole uh, infrastructure with the family, but it also was nice in the sense that when we're looking at providing culturally effective care, there are many team members that the parents could relate with or talk to, even if the pediatrician was not necessarily one they had the deepest bond. 
And so it was really fascinating and encouraging and exciting. Thanks, Kima. Johanna, do you want to reflect a little bit about what sort of what your, uh, what you thought might have been the biggest barrier and what you saw on your visit? Sure. So very surprising. Thank you, everybody, uh, for this opportunity and for joining. Uh, but very surprisingly, the same um, was what I thought was the biggest barrier was time. So I've uh, worked in internal medicine and in healthcare before. And on the other side of the administrative side and, and coordinating schedules. And so, yes, we know that every minute counts and, and every minute equals some sort of dollar amount. And so um, being able to provide that time to the, to the patients, but um, I also now work in mental health as a care coordinator or resource partner. And so being able to, um, like Kima was saying, you know, just, build those relationships that takes time especially when you're talking about social emotional development and the needs of the families in order for you to get to the underlying needs of the families you have to invest the time in getting to know um, the family and, and and it takes trust and building that trust is not a 10 minute you know every six months so so being able to have that time um, i thought that was going to be the biggest concern or the biggest challenge um, I went into the Bronx, New York for a site visit at Healthy Steps in Montefiore. And what they did is that they really developed a team that was able to, to um, use the time that the patient spent in the office very wisely. And so while somebody was going to get immunization, somebody else was coming in to check in on development and tracking, you know, with some screen. And so maximizing just the time that the patient was already spending in the practice um, was key. And also having, making time for the team to be able to communicate back and forth and, and have the family's um, interest at the forefront was one of the ways that they managed the time. Great, thank you. And Kima, do you have anything else you wanna add on? Oh, you're muted. No, it's, um, I, I think the key point is that people really I, I planned ahead and knew that would be an issue and just found creative ways to get around it. Yeah. Um, so I wondered how, uh, how do you see equity integrated across the re recommendations? We made it very explicit as, as one from the very beginning. But I think we really also tried to think about it across the board. Um, so I wondered if you guys could say a little bit about um, how do you see equity integrated across those recommendations and, and why it's so important. And I wonder, Joanna, do you want to get started there? Um, sure. So um, in terms of building national leadership and systems change, I believe cult being culturally humble is key and at all levels and being able to have difficult conversations, whether it's, you know, in the office visit, whether it's at community tables or in lobbies, um, whatever needs to be done in order for people to, as a community, come together and talk about the things that are sometimes difficult to bring up um, and not in ways that maybe has been done in the past with discrimination and, and you know, not that we are there yet, but definitely have come closer, also not ignoring it um, or, or judging people for whatever they, they bring up, but knowing that our differences is what makes us a community and, um, and being able to support one another, regardless of what you look like, what language you speak, um, and being able to have that representation um, in national leadership is very important. Um, and I think this work definitely needs to serve not just a type of group, but each individual family. And so being able to customize the care um, is going to have to be supported by national leadership. I think that's really interesting what you raised there, sort of being able to be flexible enough to meet, to, to be able to support transformation, but at the same time, 
uh, across the board for families and have access to these services, but flexible enough to meet the needs of communities and individual families um, and where they are at. Kima, what's your, what's your take on this question? Um, so I feel that many of the groups really did think about equity um, as they're putting their, their programming together. But one, I think it's important that they also recognize when they didn't always achieve it. And equity, you know, being more than just race and ethnicity, but um, people who work different times. So some of them couldn't have, um, couldn't be a part of the program because they could only come in at the night or during the weekends and that wasn't possible. Not all of them were in multiple languages and so not always parents could come in, but a recognition of that reality and thinking about how to improve it was pretty um, consistent throughout all of the programs. Um, I think another piece about equity is the um, recognition that it's not just between the provider team and the family, but internal to that provider team. How we work, these are new roles, new workforce um, members that now folks have to learn to work together and they come from different places and they come from um, different perspectives and how do you have respect and honesty within the team and realizing that everyone on the team has a role and being humble enough to listen because all of those ideas are going to be what helps you engage with and improve family and children's outcomes. Um, and so I think it's really thinking about it at multiple different levels. And I completely agree that, um, you know, individuals are individuals. That's why I hate the idea of cultural competence, because you're never really competent um, unless you're lying to yourself. And so it's really about that cultural humility, which Melanie Turvalon talked about so much, where you have to listen to individuals. And if that's baked in, the nice thing with many of these projects is even if someone couldn't come in on the weekend, those same doctors were seeing patients on the weekend and used many of these skills in those other visits. Thanks. Um, and it makes me wonder a little bit about, I think a key part of, of equity is thinking about engaging the folks that are gonna be most affected. And um, Joan, I wonder if you wanna speak a little bit about that recommendation we made around um, investing and incentivizing sort of partnerships with family-led organizations to do that work and sort of how that how this experience was for you and what what you would would love to see happen in the future around that recommendation oh you're on mute <laughs> trying to unmute here <laughs> sure so i think that in especially identifying and, and eliminating the system barriers um it's it would be very hard to identify barriers that you don't have, right? So I think that's where the um, community partnership comes in, not just with family, um, you know, family advocates and people who are working with families, but the families themselves and the parents themselves, because they're their child's best advocate and they're with them all the time, right? So um, being in the brain trust definitely for me was an opportunity to share my opinion personally, but also in working with families, share what their experiences were. So being able to um, to have, so for instance, we talked, one of the barriers that um, came up to, in regards to access to services was transportation. I have a car, but I know clients who don't have a car. So I can speak from my experience, but I can also speak from other people's experiences. And if that is not something that you're faced to with day to day, then how would you know that that is a barrier, right? And so a lot of times um, when people talk about um, having boards or having um, advocacy, or I'm sorry, advisory committees there, if the community is not included. And if there's not, if there is something, if there's not an incentive for the parent to show up, right? Sometimes we say, why, why are the parents not showing up? But if there's not an incentive, the parent is not gonna show up because if we're talking again, we're talking about social emotional development and reducing the parent's stress. If we're trying to reduce the parent's stress, but at the same time, we're trying to give them something else to do and not give them an incentive, that parent is not gonna show up. And it's not because they don't wanna advocate for their child. It's not because they are not interested. It's because they're already stressed. And, and so um, just being able to provide a place for people to share their opinions, for people to filter some of that information. I know um, 
where I work, we created a parent advisory committee and that led to some opportunities for us to find out what the community needed. And, and sometimes even to be able to apply for certain grants that we didn't know we uh, were, were gonna be able to serve that community. So it, it just, I think it doesn't hurt and it could only inform practice more to have the people who go through those barriers be able to identify them. Thanks. I just add um, that. I'm sorry. Sure. So no, go totally, for it. It totally triggered something. I agree with everything Johanna said. I think the other piece that was fascinating with some of them along this equity piece was they listened to the parents that are in their groups. And it became especially clear when they started talking about linking to community resources. Because the parents would be like, yeah, no, that particular location is not good. And it doesn't have X, Y, Z or this one, you know, doesn't speak Amharic, and so you don't want to go there. And so there has to be this thought towards which providers of those social services and others are also trying to provide culturally relevant care. But then in addition to some of them having um, input from parent boards, it was really remarkable also the parents who were in the clinic or in the group they were seeing, taking their feedback and revamping in real time. Yeah, and I think one of the places where we, we make that connection to the community system or a networked approach is the power to turn that data, turn that, um, and have a place where then we can actually do some work to improve quality of services um, and, and have sort of be able to be able to really have that outlet and that accountability. And we saw that, for instance, in, with um, Family Connects in Durham, where they use the data and the feedback from families in a loop to service providers so that they could um, improve quality of service across the community. Um, so I want to put out to the to the audience, to the webinar participants, if they have any questions, please uh, start to put them in your in the queue in the QA, Q&A box so that we can, we can be sure to, to answer those for you. Questions for our panels or questions for Selena and I about the project. Um, as we're waiting for those, I wanted to, Kima, ask you to, to reflect on one last thing. And I, I mentioned that you were very good at keeping us focused on that need for an advocacy and communications agenda. And I wondered if you wanted to say anything more about why you think that's so central to, this, to these next steps. Absolutely. Um, clearly, I'm an advocate by heart, but I, what happens is for many of these, we identify, we talked a lot about time restraints. We didn't talk a lot about financial constraints, but that is massive, right? And it's massive, not in terms of just doing the infrastructure to build things, but that sustainability piece. You don't want to create something that's amazing, have parents completely engaged, and then not have it be sustainable. So if you don't think about how to, and you know, much of the sustainability comes from other payers, be it Medicaid, be it private insurers, be it block grants because people are uninsured or FQHCs, people aren't going to pay for something they don't know about or that hasn't been shown to have an effect. Um, and so having an advocacy agenda, and I think, you know, you don't even have to create necessarily your own team. There's many folks advocating out there that can be linked to and and you know have advocacy for whole children and whole families but knowing what you're what you think you're providing how you're providing it what the extra um, funding is going for and why those outcomes are important you have to start developing those relationships early if you want to get to the end point and have that sustainability um, because many I, I worked on the hill and many um, legislators whether they're on the state federal other level there are myriad and millions of people coming with requests for things right and if they don't understand your request and you go there right at the time your program's going to fall apart and be sustainable it's not going to be sustained that's just being honest um, and so having that up front is important and i think it actually not only builds for that long-term sustainability but it builds relationship it recognizes and understands the need and importance of families and providers and the whole system working together, but it, it matters. Yeah. And I think that theme of relationships comes through there, that it's not going to happen if we do by community, community by community or program by program, but really this is an opportunity for programs and physicians and parents to join together and early childhood uh, systems folks to really come together. We all have very similar um, and I think we all have similar goals and values, 
And how can we together really advocate for some of these things that we need? So how can we have the financing for that expanded care team and for that care team to work really well together and be able to build and uh, support the community partnership that we need? And that I think is something we all share as a key um, thing that we need we need to, to access. Um, so we don't have any questions yet, but I'm curious from the uh, folks on joining our webinar, if they have any reflections, and you can either share it as a question or maybe in the chat, what is coming up for you um, in terms of these barriers and recommendations? What might be possible, you think, uh, in your community now? We'd love to, to hear a little bit about um, what you're thinking as you listen to our, our webinar and to our great panelists. Radio silence, maybe, you know, I would be interested if, if someone on the line said what they thought the biggest barrier was, would be, because then maybe we could give them some ways that the groups were able to overcome it. We have a question. So people think about that. We'd love to hear about that in the chat. Um, but we have a question from Fiona Ritchie. We have a hard time finding language around social, uh, social emotional health that resonates with conservative legislatures. Let any legislators, any advice, particularly for infant mental health. I welcome folks to also put in the chat their thoughts, but Kima, please, what, what do you think? Yeah, you know, as much as it a uh, little bit breaks my heart, it really is the um, kind of looking out financial aspect. It's the, this is preparing people for readiness to, for kindergarten so they can engage. This is going to save money in some other metrics. If you really create, you know, healthy dyads and healthy families, um, it's often going to keep mom from depression and, and things that may, or at least identify it early and, and um, save money in the long run. So, so those are some of the ways I think it builds. Um, so, but really that longer term connection to school. And that's hard, right? Because we don't have a lot of the data that's going to prove X, Y, Z. And I am a huge proponent of data. I truly believe in data. Having said that, a lot of legislators are not necessarily looking for the latest peer-reviewed literature. And so I think using some intuitive long-term um, outlook is helpful in many ways. But at the end of the day, money is a big one. But I think that Fiona's point is a great one to be think to pro and I really think that's something that as we're thinking about future steps with pediatric supporting parents initiative. This group of funders is, this was just phase one for them. They are really thinking strategically about phase two of their work, but this is a great question to bring to them that I know I'm sure other groups have been thinking a lot about and there are efforts like zero to three um, efforts around young children and their advocacy platform that we can really think babies that I think there's opportunities definitely to build from and join with on this work focused on social emotional development. This was actually a Go question on. that came up um, during our last gathering and um, because, so the program that I work in is Child First and that is what we do in mental health. And a lot of times, um, not only to the legislators, but even to the parents, it's a hard term to understand because there's a lot of people still with, uh, after again, all the research and, and all the articles out there that don't believe that infants have mental health. Um, <laughs> and, so, and so being able to have some common language is important. I think a lot of times we talk about it as attachment and we talk about it as uh, the relationship and not only, I mean, the educational piece and, and the outcomes that we are starting to see more and more information on. Um, yes, are related to education, but also um, more recently, we're also seeing that they're related to physical health as well. So I think that's another point that, um, that may be able to get some buy-in. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Fazia Askew shared that the AAP has some great tools to kind of get folks started to think about those pathways um, and, and community partnerships and raises public health 
as another important partner around getting folks connected to services. And that is definitely a place, part of that early childhood system as a, as a public health person here, that your maternal and child health departments, I think, are a great opportunity. So we're coming near the end of our, our webinar here. And um, so we're going to, can go to the next slide, Selena? That's the last slide. <laughs> oh, it is the last slide. Oh, I was sad that we didn't, we meant to, we're missing one slide, but I wanted to thank everyone for their participation in the webinar and, and learning more about our report. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email that gets to these materials and the slides and the webinar recording. Um, and please continue to, we'll continue to uh, let you know and keep you updated about next more resources or development with the PSP initiative. But thank you so much for joining. And if you have any questions or great ideas, please uh, email uh, Selena or I with your, with your great thinking. And thank you to both of our panelists. We really welcome, we really are just so um, thankful and grateful for your work throughout the project that helped us get here, but also for your great thoughts and thinking today. Thanks a lot. Thank All you. right. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. 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 -bye.